Welcome everyone. The title of my talk is Malicious Cooperation Between Benign Looking Processes. Uh, and the topic of our work is attacks against um, behavioral ransomware detectors. I'm Lorenzo De Carli from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and this is joint work with my colleagues from La Sapienza University of Rome. Let's begin. Machine learning has been incredibly successful and has revolutioned a number of areas in computer science. Um, because we are security people, we mostly care about the advancements that machine learning brought in security, and in particular in malware detection. So as astounding as the development of machine learnings are, in the recent years, we have started understanding that there is a class of attacks that can significantly limit the effectiveness of machine learning approaches when applied to security. And I'm referring to adversarial attacks. So I believe most people at this point know what those are, so I will only describe, describe them briefly. So in general, when machine learning is applied to a security problem, most commonly we define a classifier to distinguish benign from malicious objects of interest, regardless of the specific of the object type. So we, in an adversarial attack, or one type of adversarial attack, the one we care about, um, the characteristic of a malicious object are modified so that the object remains malicious, but the features that the object express lead the classifier to, the, to classify that object as benign. All right. Okay, so enough about background. I think now it's time to introduce the main guest of my talk, which is ransomware. Ransomware is a type of malware which infects either an individual machine or all machines in a certain net, local network and encrypts user files. Then shipping the encryption um, key to a remote server and asking for a ransom in order to decrypt the file back. A ransomware attack, particularly a severe one, can prevent even a large, a large organization from functioning, bringing their operation to a halt. Um, just a few days ago, the news made the round that a person, I think, in Germany died because um, the hospital to which she was being transported became suddenly non-functional due to a ransomware attack and the person died. So the, the bottom line is that there is plenty of evidence that ransomware attacks can have a significantly uh, negative effect on the organization that are victims. Uh, for this reason, a uh, lot of smart people have spent a lot of time thinking of ways we can identify ransomware activity in a computer system and stop it. Okay, so when we think about ransomware detection, the two general uh, uh, malware detection approaches apply. The first one is um, signature-based detection, where we attempt to identify a malware binary based on static features of the binary itself. Uh, these signature-based approaches are becoming increasingly ineffective nowadays due to the proliferation of obfuscation and packing techniques that malware authors can use. Because of this, then uh, researchers have started to increasingly look at a different class of detectors, behavioral detectors, which instead look at the dynamic behavior of a potentially suspicious process um, because, and the, and the rationale here is that it's much harder to fake dynamic behavior than to fake static features because then in order to accomplish their own, their goal, a particular malware binary needs to execute certain operations. What does this mean in the context of ransomware? So in the context of ransomware, um, if we think about how ransomware operates, its goals, once a system has been infected, are to encrypt as many user files as possible in a small amount of time. These results in features at the level of file system activity, which are intuitively rather different from the features that we expect from a benign process. Okay, what do I mean by that? Uh, I, let, let's look at a few, a few features that ransomware expresses. So first, ransomware encrypts all files that, that it accesses which results in high entropy content being written to those files. Uh, whereas a benign, when a benign process writes to a file, the, the entropy of the content may be high or may be low. It doesn't necessarily have to be high all the time. Um, ransomware also overwrites entire files. And again, 
this is a rather uncommon behavior for a benign process. If you modify a file with a word processor, the file after your modifications are, is likely to share at least some content, some parts with the file prior to the modifications. Um, and, and this also implies that then the ransomware completely changed the file content. Not only changes the file content, but it also changes the file type um, because post encryption, regardless of the original file type, um, a file is going to appear like a um, nondescript random looking binary blob. Uh, it's extremely unlikely or uncommon for a benign process to actually perform this change. Other characteristics. So ransomware accesses as many files as possible result in, resulting in a lot of file system operations. Uh, and encrypts all user files, which means that a ransomware process will access a number of different and unrelated file types, documents, spreadsheets, images, and whatnot. Um, these, again, these behaviors are rather uncommon for benign processes. There are some benign processes that do things like that, such as file system indexers, but, but most benign processes tend not to do these. Uh, and similarly, ransomware also tend to access files in every user directory. And finally, because for a ransomware attack, time is of the essence, a ransomware process will attempt to encrypt as many files as, as it can, as quickly as it can, which results in a very high frequency of file system operation. So all those considerations suggest that it should be possible and relatively easy to train a behavioral detector to distinguish between ransomware and um, benign processes based on features uh, derived from the characteristics I just listed. And a number of uh, previously proposed work that do just that. And I'll talk about two of them because those are the two that we attack in our own work. So the first work I'm gonna talk about is ShieldFS. ShieldFS was published in AXA 2016. At high level, uh, it proposes to protect file system by shadowing write operations performed by processes in a protected area on the file system in such a way that if a process is la later determined to be ransomware, the process is terminated and the content of the system pre-encryption is restored using the uh, the data saved in the protected area. So how does ShieldFS determine whether a process is benign or ransomware? It does it based on a number of features uh, which are based on the characteristics I described a few slides ago. And the observation of, of ShieldFS authors is the value distribution of those features. It's quite different between benign and ransomware processes. Now, there is more complexity to ShieldFS because it also, replicate this uh, classification model at different time scales to deal with situations where a process begins its life as benign and rather becomes malicious to process injection, but high level, it works as described. In order to perform detection, there are a few additional moving parts. Um, the process model I discussed based on the features in the previous slides is applied to every process. For ambiguous situation, whether a process cannot be determined to be malicious or benign, uh, ShieldFS also looks at the uh, uh, system level uh, file system activity without discriminating between processes. And finally, attempts to identify cryptographic function into the process image. But those two last components, the file system, um, the, excuse me, the system level model and the uh, crypto function identification are only triggered when a process is determined to be suspicious by the per process model. So if we break the per process model, no other factor comes into play. The second detector I'm gonna talk about is RWGuard from RAID 2018. It works in principle similarly to ShieldFS, so I'll discuss it only briefly. It begins with a process monitor, which is similar in spirit to the one that ShieldFS uses. Um, if a process is determined to be benign based on this monitor, nothing happens. Otherwise, a number of other components, it comes into play, which looks at the file uh, be modified. And if all those analyses agree, then the process is considered ransomware and terminated. But uh, similar to ShieldFS, the root of all the decision processes is the process monitor. If a process is never flagged 
as malicious by the pre process classifier, then nothing happens and ransomware can continue undisturbed. Okay, so our goal is to evaluate the robustness of this class of approaches. Uh, how do we go about um, potentially evading those approaches? So one challenge is that the behavioral classifiers I just described and a number of other works from literature um, look at features that by design are inextricably linked with ransomware activity. So a ransomware, ransomware attack needs to express those features in order to function. Okay, high number of read, write, and directory listing, and high entropy, and things like that. Um, one possible hint about how to go about evading them is that all those approaches all, all, are all based on individual process behavioral model. So they collect features at the level of individual processes and they perform detection of the granularity of individual processes. So the question is, given those consideration, how can we express the lower, excuse me, how can we lower the expression of ransomware features at the process level? So naive approaches such as reducing the feature expression by reducing the number of operations means that the attack fails, right? Uh, uh, the, the process in question, we want the crypto user files. Um, and if we, dis if we want to crypt all user, all user files by a single process, then we'll run into the problem that we're expressing the features that the classifier expects. So the insight here then is to go beyond an individual process and distribute ransomware operations across a number of independent and cooperating processes. Um, and we defined and investigated different classes of attacks, all based on the same principle. And I'll discuss each of them in a few words in the next slides. So the first attack we propose is process splitting. So if we look at the activity of a single process ransomware, it will perform a number of different functions such as read, write, directory listing, and so on, on a, number of, a large number of elements in the file system. Process splitting is simply based on the idea that we can have multiple ransomware processes doing all those things. And if we split the general workload across multiple processes, we can have each process only work on a small, small set of files. Um, simple parallelization approach. This works, as we will see later, but uh, um, it requires a lot of processes to reduce feature expression enough that a classifier does not identify activity. Uh, in a sense, the proce process explosion itself can then be considered a feature that be could potentially be used to detect this attack. So we move on to a second, uh, more complex approach, which we call functional split. Again, if we look at how a single process ransomware works, it performs all those different functions such as reading, writing, etc. But there is nothing to say that those functions have to be performed all by the same process. In the functional splitting attack, we define, we split the activity of the ransomware in a number of processes, each perform either a single function or a small number of functions. And to make the attack more effective, then we define multiple groups of such processes. In, um, so this is basically an extension. Uh, the second part is an extension of the process splitting approach in which, um, and basically in this way, we have multiple functional groups, um, each operating on a small set of user files. Combined, this result in a multi-process ransomware, which also evade detector, uh, but requires a small number of processes to avoid detection. This approach still has problems because um, in general, it still results in activity which is quite peculiar compared to that of a benign process. So even if existing behavioral classifiers are not trained to detect this particular attack, they, in, in principle they could because this activity looks quite different from that of benign processes. So we then we look at a third class of attacks, the mimicry attack. And this is a classic mimic, mimicry attack and in which we observe the behavior of benign processes and we teach a ransomware process to just imitate the particular behavior. So basically modeling the features of benign processes and regulating feature expression of each individual ransomware process so that it imitates the feature expression of benign processes. Before looking at the results, uh, a few words on the features themselves that we uh, considered for our implementation of this attack. We implemented this attack in a 
proof of concept multi-process ransomware. Um, we decide to ignore entropy-based features, so features that attempt to determine whether a certain file has been encrypted or not, uh, because we found these features to be weak, uh, because many, um, many modern uh, document types uh, are compressed, which results in high entropy content, which is hardly distinguishable from encrypted content. And in general, we found that the, the te techniques that we analyze don't give much weight to entropy, probably for this reason. Um, and this applies both to writes at the entire file level or individual writes. In terms of features based on normalized counts of operations such as read and writes, um, all basically those features are easy to tune, to tune down by uh, lowering the number of operations by distributing the um, the workload across multiple processes, and this happens in all the attacks that we describe, that I describe. Um, there are other features which are uh, superficially trickier to evade, but they're actually easier, nearly as easy to evade too, such as file similarity after write. Uh, in this case, it's simply enough to have different processes to encrypt different sections of a file. Um, we discuss uh, those features and other features and their evasion in the paper in detail. So if you're interested in the in evasion techniques uh, specific to individual features, you're encouraged to look at our paper. Now, results. So the first attack we evaluate is process splitting and both the detectors uh, in, we considered can be evaded given a sufficient number of um, of processes, the problem is that due to its simplicity, this attack requires a large number of processes to be instantiated in order to be effective as expected. We then looked at functional splitting and, and we can see here that the, this attack reduces the num number of processes necessary to avoid detection by order of magnitudes. Only 20 processes are necessary to evade shield FS. We, in the paper, we also discussed uh, the impact of the particular way the functions are split on the accuracy of the detector and the number of processes. And this is what figure B describes. And if you're more interested in this particular aspect, you're again encouraged to look at the paper. Um, this functional splitting attack is also effective uh, with RWGuard. It's also reduced um, the number of processes necessary for the attack. And uh, although Differently from our first attack, the number of processes necessary to evade the RW guard with functional splitting is higher than the number of processes necessary to evade shield effects with functional splitting. Finally, we evaluated the mimicry attack. This attack results in full evasion of all classifiers under examination and also full evasion of a commercial detector. Um, which, uh, which we believe to be based uh, on machine learning techniques, based on promotional material by the company, uh, although we don't know, or we're not aware of the particular training set that was used to train this commercial detector. So we, tra we uh, treated this as a black box detector. In all cases, the detectors are fully evaded. Uh, the number of processes necessary for this attack depends on basically the feature expression profile of benign processes that we attend, uh, we attempt to imitate. So there is a constraint in this attack on the number of processes because um, the features, the feature expression we want to imitate binds us to use a certain number of processes. Uh, but this attack results effectively in, against all detector we evaluate. And this concludes my talk and I'll be happy to take questions.